I'm going to introduce myself in the next slide. Um, but first, I want to get the audience participation. Who has never heard of a Raspberry Pi? Everyone in the room, awesome. Who has never heard of Redis? Redis is a database server that is intended for key value storage. So if I've got a long running query and I want to cache it so I don't have to run the expensive query every time, I can give a key and store the value temporarily. And Redis has all these built in facilities for automatically expiring uh, values and um, caching. And it's really quick for key lookups. So it makes it awesome for that. I'm not using it for that. I'm using it for a public drive. Uh, so I publish my messages to it and I read messages from a specific channel. Who has never heard of LEDs? <laughs> They're light bulbs. Who has never heard of Mario? Mario is a fictional character built by uh, Nintendo, originally created by Shigeru Miyamoto. Okay, let's move on. My name is James Alexander. I am a systems engineer for Leaf Software Solutions, basically program stuff. Um, Leaf Software is a sponsor for, in, uh, for Pi Ohio this year. Um, so. I wanted to give them a quick plug. We do large-scale electronic records processing. So I've been doing uh, automotive financial uh, systems. Um, and recently, we're moving into more rapid uh, minimum viable product development. Uh, large-scale ERPs are multiple years. Rapid MVPs are two to three months, maybe four months, so that a quick product we can get off the ground and hit the market quickly. Uh, we also do cloud DevOps deployments. So if you've got an internal infrastructure and you want to move to AWS, if you want to move to Azure, um, we've got some guys on staff that can help you do that. Or if you want to move between clouds or away from the cloud or whatever. We also do Microsoft CRM and Dynamics work. So if you want to install those tools or ma manage them or get support and you live in the Indianapolis area, uh, look us up. I have business cards. You can uh, chat with me and I will direct you to someone else. <laughs> I do not do any of that stuff and um, we can get you set up that way. All of the slides and the code is available on, on my blog here. Um, I blog uh, consistently about once a year and I found <laughs> The past three years, I've blogged on the coffee bot. So just pick any of the last three blog posts, and you've got some information to look at there. So what are we doing here? Um, this is because I said I was on a multiple year, and I got off of a project. And so um, I had some bench time. So I had to decide what to go and do with myself. Um, like any office, we have and we always decide that um, uh, we have the case where there's an empty coffee pot and you have to always make new coffee regardless of if you know it's brand it's the first thing in the morning or if it's mid morning there should always be coffee there right because someone just made it if you kill the joe that doesn't seem to be the case so we chatted internally and said what if we could measure how much coffee we have in the pot at any given time and we have this habit of kind of spitballing and talking around saying what if we use this use that and we have this engineering Rube Goldberg machine of how can we solve any problem with the most complicated thing. And so that's what we're going to get into next. The critical piece of infrastructure that I needed was the scale. That's on the left side here. The scale is a USB postage scale. So what it can do is you, it's a inter USB interface, you plug it into the back of the Raspberry Pi and it shows up as a human interface device. So uh, the Raspberry Pi is in the upper right and the bottom right here is an LED panel. You can buy these from Adafruit. This is a 16 by 32, which you'll see uh, later on here. Um, the, what made this whole thing work is when I went to look for scales that were going to work, I found a C library that included a list of different scales that were going to work. Um, the, this scale that GitHub repository right here at the bottom, there's also an accompanying USB scale.c file that knows how to read data off of each of these scales individually. I was trying to decide which of these scales to buy because I know that these are going to work with Linux because this guy got it to work. Um, I figured that 30 pounds is too much because a full pot of coffee is about 5 pounds, so I didn't want to have too much of a scale. At the same time, I didn't want to have a 5 pound scale because I didn't want to max out my scale every single time I put coffee on it because people are going to just jam the thing down and I didn't want to damage the scale. So I picked the Dymo 10 pound scale, which is kind of right in the middle. I received an email from some guy on the internet one time saying he tried to do the same thing that I where he would connect a scale to a Raspberry Pi and try to get data off of it. He was running into an issue where the, the scale would automatically turn off. There's an auto shutoff after five minutes. I never ran into this issue, I think because I've always got something on the scale. So at the end of the day, we leave our coffee pot on it, and so it continues to send voltage to the Raspberry Pi and continues to say on. I never heard back whether or not that suggestion helped him, but that's a suggestion if you run into the same, same problem. So wiring. Here is my messy desk and my. I'm a software. 
from my wife. Um, the idea is that you've got some power that goes in the back of the LED panel here, and I've got just two tiny DuPont jumper cables that just sit in the back of this uh, uh, wiring right here. This is really cool. If you move it, if you drop it, it's going to come disconnected, um, which is one of the problems we're running into now. This sits on top of our fridge. So as someone opens and closes the fridge door, there's a vibration that runs through the whole fridge. And these jumper wires that go into the GPIO pins of the, the Raspberry Pi get shuffled, jostled, and will work themselves loose. So uh, it's time for take a break. Let's, take, let's move on after that. Um, a better way to wire it is with this little adapter board. The, the library that I, I mentioned here um, is an awesome, awesome library. He wrote uh, some uh, C code that would um, read and, and will allow you to uh, write uh, images, text, and any um, thing you want to these uh, writes or these LED panels. He also included wiring diagrams and also included this image to show how you can use an adapter board and this ribbon cable with an IDC connector to plug in directly to the back of the LED panel. Here I'm three panels chained together. Um, so if you can drive three panels off of a single Raspberry Pi, you can do it all with this board with three connections. Um, as a hello world, I put it on here so I can show you my wiring, you know, using the individual wires. This is supposed to be a rotating square. If you kind of squint, you can, you can see it a little. What it's actually supposed to look like is something more like this. So just to show you that you should keep trying and maybe you wire it the correct way. Um, <laughs> What it was is that I was wiring for a Raspberry Pi 1, and I was Raspberry into a Raspberry Pi 3. There are 24 pins on the 1, and there are 36 pins on the 3. So make sure you're looking at the right wiring diagram when you're uh, going to wire this up. So Linux is notoriously bad at maintaining Wi-Fi connections. This is true on the Raspberry Pi as well. Um, even the 3 has a built-in Wi-Fi chip, and uh, I didn't personally test it because I just assumed it was going to fail. We, we included this Wi-Fi script. All this does is we hide, uh, tie this into cron. So every five minutes this runs, uh, it tries to ping our router. If it can't, it will run if down and then run if up immediately afterwards. This also works great when um, our local admin will change the Wi-Fi password uh, every six months or so. Um, and I don't want to have to take the Pi off the fridge, plug it into my laptop, change the configuration for it because I forgot to do it. So I'll SSH in like the morning before it changes set the new Wi-Fi password, and then this will continually try and ping it until the password changes, and I get the new password and the new Wi-Fi configuration without having to take the file off the fridge. So let's look at the hardware. Let's look at some software design. Maybe. So the scale at the bottom left here is being read by my coffee underscore scale.py script. This is just basically an infinite loop that will read the data off of the scale. Um, once per second. This will publish messages to Redis based on my business of when I want new messages or new things to appear on the LEDs display. The subscriber here on the right is called PubSub, publish subscribe, and will listen for those messages. And based on whatever it's sent in Redis, it will render and start executing a different animations file. Animation scripts are just plain executable Python scripts that will draw uh, the, the LEDs uh, pixels on the screen based on that library I mentioned earlier, the Henner Zeller library. To read data off of the scale, I have to open a file in binary mode. And the file is the human interface device that I mentioned before. You plug in USB to the back of the Raspberry Pi, and it shows up as a device. Um, here I'm reading four unsigned integers, so 16 bytes off of the file. And I use uh, just a stranded Python file, and I unpack it into what is going to be a tuple. Regardless, if you read four characters or one character, you're always going to get a tuple back from unpack, and so you have to account for, account for that fact. Here's the full function that I use. So here's the human interface device opening the file for binary read, and then in context you can see that um, the fourth element of the struct is the, is of the tuple is the actual weight in grams. I found this out just by doing print on this. It's like, oh, look at that. <laughs> the weight is always on the fourth tuple. I am having an issue with it recently, though. Um, the file.read command will hang on me. So it doesn't throw an exception. It doesn't stop. It just continually sits there and, and fails to read, and it doesn't move on. 
my assumption is that there's some sort of power fluctuation that uh, the scale doesn't have enough power or I'm not getting 16 bytes fully read out of the thing. So it's just kind of hanging there. What I did to solve it, which is kind of uh, a hack, hack job here, I'm using a Unix signal and it's a SIG alarm. So basically I say, wait five seconds and if you don't hear from me, call this function and this function throws an exception. So if I'm sitting here waiting to read and five seconds pass, it throws an exception, kicks it out of its read, and it can continue on with the next iteration of the loop. Uh, I'm doing other interesting things here, like writing to a Dynamo table, because IoT needs to write to the cloud. Um, and specifically Dynamo, because I have a single scale writing once per second, so we need the, the type of scale that Dynamo provides. Um, here is the actual script that will um, write a fixed set of text on my LED panel. I'll show you some screenshots here in a minute. Um, but here I'm calling Redis, so redis.publish. And so I specify a named queue, which is just a channel, just a string, and whatever I want to display on it. My message will either be um, some text that I'm displaying, or it'll be a random animation. My business rules are if less than a mug in the coffee pot, or the coffee pot has been sitting on the scale longer than two hours, don't display how much is in there, assume it's bad coffee, and display some kind of random animation, which is where Mara's going to come in. Yeah? Does Redis have a, a, a method to publish, subscribe, fill in the image, or is it like a subscribe? Yeah, this function does the publish. So it will publish to a channel, and then I've got another side on the, you'll see in a minute, where I listen to that channel. So it's, it actually is built into Redis. I didn't have to write any of this myself. This is the Redis object. So initially, all I had was a scale connected to a Raspberry Pi. I didn't have a panel on it at all. So in the beginning, there was just a CSV file of wait. And so then they would, I would um, disconnect the Raspberry Pi, put it on my desk, and I would graph it like this. And I was shocked to learn that the wait changes in the morning. But there is no activity. You see, there is no activity in the afternoon. Um, I don't know why people drink coffee in the morning. Maybe they're asleep. So on the other side here, um, I'm showing how you subscribe. So again, this is just straight off of a Redis object. Uh, I create a pub sub object, and I subscribe to some name channel. Um, I'm, uh, this is a little bit paraphrased for the sake of getting it all on one slide, but I'm using a, uh, an environment variable here instead of a fixed string. Um, and there's a little bit more going on here. Uh, so this is my main loop for listening. Um, and I ran into an issue with the Redis library. So um, since Redis for Python is a C extension, um, whenever you hit control C, if C is doing something, the C code is doing something, you don't actually get the signal sent to Python to cancel the process. And so it sits there and it doesn't respond to your control C. Also, it won't halt my separate process because I'm spawning a separate process for each animation. So even if I did get the, the listening process to close, I still have something animating on the LED panel that different clever closes. So that's why I have a special method that I just call kill that after it that's based on whatever PID that I've saved off, it will unsubscribe to my listener and it will move on and we'll kill the process. The actual process itself looks like this. And again, this is made possible by, via the Penner Zeller library that I've mentioned a couple of times now for wiring and everything. Um, I just can call Python with whatever script that I've derived from his base classes. Uh, there's a couple special properties here that I pass at, pro at the command line. The hardware pulse, it, the GPIO pins uh, share the sound subsystem on the Raspberry Pi. So if you were just sending straight GPIO to this, uh, you're gonna get a warning from this library saying, hey, you can't do that. You need to turn off this hardware pulse subsystem. So that's what this is doing. I have a 16 row LED panel. So that's why I'm specifying 16 here. And then this last parameter is intended to help with ghosting. So if there's a single pixel in the middle of the screen, right now I've still got ghosting around that pixel. You can see they're kind of on, they're kind of not. Um, this parameter is supposed to help you with that. It's a pulse bus modulation of the signal going to the, the LED. So no matter what value I put in here, I still got ghosting. And I only notice it when I'm at home alone in my uh, office when it's dark. At the office, there's uh, plenty of lights and it's not that big of a deal. So um, I just live with it. The base class that all of my animations derive from are here. There are tons of options that I've omitted for brevity. Um, but the library is here. We just set up a matrix. It's a, you know, a two-dimensional array of LED panels, uh, pixels, right? Um, so you set up your options, set up your matrix. 
Um, and then I listen for a sig term event. So my listening process is going to try and kill each process if I try to you know, cancel the process or if I want to render something else. This is what the fixed text animation looks like. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that I wanted to display two lines of text because I've got just enough pixels for two lines, uh, horizontal lines on my, on my panel. And so I send a special message that's got two colons in the front of it. Um, so the first line is going to be the top line, the second part is the second line. And the library gives me draw text. And I specify a font, and he's got a dozen or so different fonts in there. And I believe my next will show you, if you look at the 9 by 7 these panels are intended to be chained together. So ideally, you can have a big wall of these things, like at New York Times Square, and this would actually, you'd see the whole thing. But on 16 by 32, you don't see the whole thing. 6 by 9 looks a little bit better. I'm writing 1, 2, 3, 4 on two different lines here. So I can get most of my message on the first line. Um, 5 by 7 is actually what we used in production. Because when I use 4 by 6, the lowercase m looked an awful lot like a capital H. So if I were saying four mugs, the panel looked like it said four hugs. <laughs> which I don't know if your coffee hugs you in the morning. Um, maybe you need a little more coffee. The first version of what we had in the break room was this tiny little spark core with a tiny little LED panel. Uh, we wired this up to a HipChat channel. So you could write in HipChat, and the message would appear on this on the break room. Um, we eventually decided that I want a little bit bigger screen than this tiny dicky thing on a breadboard. The thing on the right here is a micro USB cable, so that's really not much bigger than, than that. Um, but it was cool, right? Um, for the longest time after that, once we got the LED panel installed, all we could do with it was call the library C code, which would display text on it, and it would render a marquee and it would just scroll past like this. So that's all we could do for about seven months. And then something amazing happened. We got Python library you know, with the C bindings so that I could write Python code and render uh, to this panel. So um, here is an example of some Python code. This is my very first uh, animation, which is kind of garbage. Um, here is my, the name of the script that's scanning that pixel. pixel. Um, if you're a fan of PEP8, and we really all should be, you should be uh, cursing my name for using a hyphen and my module name. Um, I apologize. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. Um, I get away with it here because these hyphen script names are all at the very end, and none of these are imported by something else. So if you try to import these into a different library, you're going to get syntax exceptions. Essentially, all this is doing is looping over x, y's and setting a bunch of pixels. Whenever you set pixels, though, you have to turn them off. So the next iteration, you have to turn off the pixel you just turned on. So this will render kind of a uh, pixel that looks like this. You're going to see it just loop row by row, um, one, one pixel at a time. If you're on the front row, I'm, maybe you can still see a little bit of the ghosting. But the top and above, below and below, uh, above that pixel, you can still see a little bit of light that's turned on. Like I said, I never could fix that. This is my second attempt. So not just going down the rows, but I have like a car that goes back and forth. I've also seen this referred to as a Cylon, um, which <laughs> is, also, is also valid. Um, and now I get to my namesake on the, the name of the, the talk, Mario. My wife mentioned one time, what if you could draw Mario? I'm like, I bet I could. And then <laughs> I googled 8-bit Mario, and this is what I found. So all I had to do was render this many pixels, and I found that to animate them, all I would need to do is have a left foot, left hand forward, a right hand forward, and then a middle. So I needed, what, three different uh, set of pixels to fully render Mario running back and forth. So this is what I ended up with. Um, I did have to figure out how to swap him. So when this loads, he'll come in from the left to turn around and then run back the other direction. The very first version was just him standing, he would scoot left and right. <laughs> and then I was like, well, what if, what if I Googled 8 bit jumping Mario? And so then I got a jumping render, and he jump back and forth. Uh, and this I found was a little bit smoother. Has anyone heard of Conway's Game of Life? John Conway's Game of Life? I'm going to let this run because this is basically a three minute video here. Um, but having an array almost requires that you write Game of Life on it, right? So this is one of the things that happens if 
the copy is more than two hours old or there's less than a mug on it. This one I like particularly, it's called Acorn. The initial configuration is seven pixels and it will continue on for more than 5,000 generations. Um, so anyone not familiar with the rules is um, any pixel that's on here, uh, any live cell with fewer than two live numbers dies the overpopulation. Any live cell with two or three live on to the next generation. Any, cell, any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies as an overpopulation. And any dead cell with three uh, neighbors becomes a live cell with production. Um, I think I'm almost out of time based on the applause in the next room, but um, we actually need to see what it looks like. So here you see my disembodied hand on the right side. Um, and you'll see if you start, there's two mugs in it initially at 10. When I lift up, there's nothing on the scale anymore, so I get a, a game of life animation. We spend an endless amount of time pouring a cup of I'm not careful with it. Um, ideally, we should place it back on the scale, and it should weigh out to one mug at 10.32. So the next things we need to do, we need to have more than one 16 by 32 panel. Um, we need to implement the hypertext coffee protocol control, uh, <laughs> and we also need to have it return an HTTP 418, I am a teapot. Um, this, this is my to-do list. Um, thank you very much. Questions? Any questions? I think I'm out of time though, right?